Good morning, everyone. How are you all doing? God is good and his mercies endureth forever. I'm going to do, I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus to walk with me all along the pilgrim journey. I want Jesus to walk with me. Oh, in my trials, Lord, walk with me. In my trials, Lord, walk with me. journey I want Jesus to walk with me oh walked with my mother Lord I want you to walk with me and you walked with my father Lord I walk with me Pilgrim journey, Lord, I want Jesus to walk with me. Oh, in the bad times, Lord, I need you to walk with me. And even the good times, Lord, I walk with me oh, all along this old pilgrim journey Lord I want Jesus to walk with me oh, walk 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 Lord walk with me Oh, 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 walk, 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 Lord, walk with me. All along this pilgrim journey, oh, Lord, I want Jesus to walk with me. Oh, walk with me, Lord, walk with me, walk with me, Lord, Lord, walk with me, Lord, all along these pilgrim journeys, Lord, Jesus to walk with me. Blessing to be here today. Always a pleasure to be in God's house, to worship, and 
and uh, it's always a pleasure to participate with uh, this a beautiful team we have leading out in the worship service. Uh, the music folk make it so much better, so much better. Can you, can you imagine if it was the service without what they do? It would not be a very interesting place. They make a difference, and we give them thanks. Um, today, we want to spend a few minutes on talking about spirit, what it means to be led uh, by the spirit. You know, this week, um, I found an interesting story um, that headlined in several of the papers and online. Um, every year, for a few years now, the Gallup organization um, carries out this worldwide poll of countries to determine, among other things, there's a wide range of measures that they use. But among the things they measure is how, who, which is the happiest countries on earth. So there is a positivity index that determines the happiest countries on earth. Generally speaking, they have found the world, people are very positive around the world. So quite apart from the doomsayers that you hear so often, people around the world generally feel very good. Uh, but I want to ask you a question. Which countries do you think are the happiest? Which countries do you think score the highest? Now, if you've been following this, don't answer, because you already know. But for those who have not been following, make a guess. Which countries do you think are the happiest countries in the world? The poor countries? Why do we say the poor countries, though? They learn to share more, okay. Um, they probably don't have school loans, right? <clears throat> but she's onto something there. Make a guess. Asian countries, no, not yet. Closer to home. Caribbean, no, I'm from the Caribbean, but not yet. I mean, they, they don't, uh, the Caribbean islands are too small, so they're not in the, in the, <laughs> in the um, measurements generally. <clears throat> but closer to home. You know your geography, right? Don't you? It's not South America. Well, South America, yes. South America and Central America. The happiest country in the world is Paraguay. And they have a positivity score of 87. And the top nine, the top nine happiest countries are all from Central America and South America, including El Salvador, Honduras, uh, Costa Rica, Colombia, Venezuela. <laughs> right? <laughs> I, how many of you would like to go to Colombia to retire? Right? Anybody looking forward to retire in, uh, in um, Venezuela? It's a very rich country, by the way, but the wealth is concentrated on a very small uh, percentage of the people, so the vast majority of the people are in desperate need. <clears throat> and your chances of getting mugged are higher in Venezuela than in most countries of the world. But yet, they're happier, generally. Um, so the top nine, the only, the only developed country in the top 10 is Denmark. Uh, and they range in score from 81 to 87. The United States is 78. 
So right up there, right up there, not horrible, but as I said, generally speaking, around the world, people are pretty positive. Emotionally, they're okay. Financially, they may not be, but emotionally, they feel good. Um, which do you think, last question, which do you think was, had the, high, the, the lowest score? What country would you think have the, high, the lowest score? Huh? Sudan? Not Sudan. Although it's down there, it's in the, 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 the uh, bottom 10. Huh? Algeria? Afghanistan? No. Syria. Because you know what's going on in Syria, right? <clears throat> they have the lowest, they're in the 30s, 32, I think. That's, that's very low. Unfortunately, most of the top 10 are from Africa. The, the, the bottom 10 are from Africa. The people, I was encouraged by the fact that most people on average, keep in mind now, this is on average, people generally feel good. And uh, I asked myself why it is that these Central and South American countries that, um, whose economies are, like you said, among the lowest, um, have people who seem to be happy with their lives. Right? And I think it's because they don't have the, the financial burdens that others carry. I think that's a big part of it. Um, they take life as it comes. We have to, just, just driving in the traffic these days, Brother Smith, is just a highly stressful thing. I mean, it, it, you, you are taking your time driving. I'm a careful driver, right? I'm a careful driver. Um, and it is, a, it is a horrific experience to see people just cutting in front of you. I mean, they're turning, the corner is just there. Traffic is here, they're turning the corner right there. But they have to scoot in front of you and then slow down so they can take the exit right there in front of them. And I'm sitting there wondering, I mean, do, don't they ever think? But I think all of those accumulate and bring so much stress on people. But I want to share with us today how living spirit-led contributes to a life that, of greater satisfaction, a life of greater meaning, joy, and purpose. Can I direct your attention to Romans chapter 8, my favorite chapter in all the Bible? Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> and I'm going to read again the scripture reading that was so beautifully read by Sister Johnson. Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> verses 10 and 11. Verses 10 and 11. But if Christ is in you, hallelujah this morning, if Christ is in you, although your bodies are dead because of sin, I'm reading from the Revised Standard Version, your spirits are alive because of righteousness. I love that. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies. Also, through his spirit which dwells in you. So the first verse, verse 10 says, If Christ is in you, Although your body is dead because of sin, your spirits are alive because of righteousness. And verse 
11 says, if his spirit is in you, then your body becomes alive in addition to your spirit. So what are we talking about here? We have two things mean, mentioned here. We have if the spirit of God is in you, and then if Christ is in you. So what is it saying here? What is Paul implying? Is the spirit of God in us in addition to Christ? Because he talks about the spirit being in you and Christ being in you. Uh, that's, that tends to make us think about the fact that maybe they are different and they have different things to do in us. Because Christ is in us. Of course, we could also think about the fact that when, when the Holy Spirit comes into us, he represents the entire Godhead, and it's the same as saying they all are in us. However, there is a slight difference here that makes me know that Paul is referring to something a little deeper. Why do I say that? You notice when you read the verse that it talks about the Spirit of God dwelling in us. Did you see that? Go back to your Bibles real quick. Just, let's take a closer reading. It says, if Christ is in you, all right? So it says, Christ is in you, verse 10. But then in verse 11, it says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the, dwe from the dead dwells in you. So Christ is in you, but the spirit of God dwells in you. In the Greek, there, are, there is an additional word that is translated dwells. When, it, when Paul talks about in Christ, if Christ is in you, he uses an expression in whom in, which means Christ, you are positionally in Christ and Christ is in you. So that he is not so much here emphasizing what Christ is doing in you, in your life. He is referring to your position as a person who has accepted Jesus Christ as your savior. So what is he talking about? He is saying once you were over here under the power of sin, dominated by the power of sin, controlled by sin, but when Christ died on the cross, he died with you in mind. And so when you accept the provision of his cross, you now move from being in sin and now you are in Christ. Do you see the difference here? You now move from being in sin to being in Christ. And Christ is in you, and he breaks the power of sin over you so that now sin no longer reigns in your mortal body, and you are now controlled by him. So you are now a person in Christ. It, think about uh, how many of you have had a ticket? Don't, don't raise your hand, please. <clears throat> uh, how many of you have had several tickets? Um, again, don't raise it. I think, I think Ken probably has several tickets. You pay your tickets, Ken? <laughs> yeah, I know. <clears throat> but if, you, if you've had a ticket and you go, imagine if you go to pay your ticket and you discover that someone has paid the ticket so that when you stand up to pay your fine, the judge or whoever is there says to you, you don't have to pay it. It's already been paid for you. So now, you want, a moment ago, you were condemned to pay the ticket. A moment ago, you were sentenced to pay that ticket. Now you discover your status has been changed. You now no longer owe that money. It's already been paid. 
You woke up this morning guilty of running the red light. But when you went to pay it, somebody had paid your price. So your status is now changed. You know, it always freaks me out when I get a ticket. Not that I get tickets often, monkey. <laughs> it always freaks me out when I get a ticket. I look at the thing and I see um, a, a state of California versus Conroy Reynolds or something like that. I'm saying, what? A ticket? It, it, you know, it intimidates you. It's like you feel like a criminal. Well, you're a criminal. You broke the law. That's the, <laughs> but, I mean, to see the thing, the whole state or whatever, I don't remember if it's the state or the county or whoever, but I think it's the state versus me. But when I go there and I discover that I no longer have that hanging over my head, my status is changed. And I can tear it up and go home. So Paul is talking about your position. Ha, huh, my throat feels a lot better now. Paul is talking about your position as a person in Christ. You are now, the power of sin has been broken in your life. You know, Paul talks elsewhere in Ephesians. He says, once you were dead in sin, now you are alive in Christ. Your body is dead because it is subject. The principle of sin resides in your body. And you, were, and you sinned and you were under the condemnation of death. But now when you are in Christ, sin no longer reigns in your mortal body. John Wesley said, sin doesn't reign in your body anymore, but it remains. It doesn't reign, but it remains. You still have to watch it. But in spite of the fact that you are, that sin still dogs your steps, you are under the protection, the banner of Christ. And his righteousness stands for you. I don't know about you, but that does make me feel good. How many of you grew up in the church at a time when you were never quite certain that you are your, the righteousness of Christ is yours? We we're never. I remember years ago, <clears throat> I was a local elder of my church, so you know that's ancient history uh, back home, and there was this huge debate in the church because one of the most influential members in the church argued that you, no one should say that they are saved. <clears throat> that it is wrong to say that you are saved. And he, he quoted some passages, of course, from Ellen White O. Oh. Thank you. He quoted some passages from, from Ellen White that seemed to support what he was saying, that now no one has the right to say they are saved. And those, there was another faction of the church who argued that we should be able to say. So the church was torn. And they came to me to settle the question, and I could not settle it because I myself was uncertain. And it's, a, it's something, it's a tension that we as a church have faced for many years. I think now it is, it is much better. But we have, we have had that tension for many years about a person being able to say that they are saved in Christ. But if you understand, that in your position in Christ means that you have the righteousness of Christ 
If you understand that, then you can say yes. I did curse out my son this week, but yes, I'm covered by his right. I mean, I didn't do that, but I'm covered by his righteousness. Uh huh. I didn't perform as good as I know I should at work, but yet I'm covered by his righteousness. I'm not always what I should be in Christ, but I'm covered by his righteousness. In my personal performance, I am up and down, but it doesn't matter that I'm up and down like that in my personal performance, yet Christ is up here all the time, and his righteousness covers me all the time. Does that make sense to you? Because we have to understand that we are not called to be perfect. We are just called to believe in him. Some people feel we are called to be perfect, so we rely on our performance. But as you know, this week, your performance may be great. Next week, it might not be. When I passed it in, um, in the Caribbean, one, we had a pastor, he was retired, <clears throat> but he would come to a workers' meeting, and he would sit, we all knew, if he would come sit by you and he would lean over and say to you, you know, I did not sin this week. <laughs> Seriously. <clears throat> and he would recount the fact that he had been able to stay sinless. For such a, a time, not realizing that just by saying that he just sinned. We cannot rely on our performance because it's up and down. It's not what it should be. We've got to remember though that we are in Christ. But let us dig a little further into the verse 11, the spirit part. Verse 11 says, <clears throat> if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, yes, sir, <clears throat> if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead shall give life to your mortal bodies. He will give life to your mortal bodies also through that same spirit which dwells in you. So now, when you are in Christ, your position is one of security in him. When the spirit dwells in you, the word that is used there, oike, oike en homin, the word that is used there means he makes his residence in, oikos is the word that's used for house, it's where you live. So you go, when you go home, you go into your oikos. You dwell there. You live there. That's where you reside. That's your home. That's the word that's used here about the Holy Spirit. It's not used about Jesus. It's used about the Holy Spirit. So it is the Holy Spirit now who puts, who makes his residence in you. So picture this. You woke up this morning covered by the righteousness of Jesus. Can we say amen? But not only were you covered by the righteousness of Jesus, you also had his spirit in you because he resides there. He lives there. He doesn't go anywhere. He's in you. That's his place of residence. You know, every person, let me just direct you to a scripture. Let's just read one scripture. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 5. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 5. Can someone read it for us? Mm. Mm. 
When we were dead in sin, <clears throat> God, through the Holy Spirit, quickened us or made us alive in Christ. See, we are in Christ. That's our position. And we get the Spirit now who works in us and makes us alive. So we have, we're, we're okay. Uh, we're secure in Jesus. But the Holy Spirit now works in us every day to help to empower us and to keep us going even when we want to give up. The Holy Spirit then keeps us uh, climbing, keeps us growing, keeps us striving, keeps giving us victory after victory every day. Holy Spirit makes us sweet when we want to be nasty. Holy Spirit makes us good when we want to be evil. Holy Spirit keeps us together when we are when we want to divide holy spirit keeps us going when we want to give up holy spirit makes us good because we're naturally evil so it's the holy spirit working in us every day that makes the difference but all the time we're covered by the righteousness of jesus and we're walking every day in him listen church Today you can rejoice. Today you can, you, you, can, you can hold your head up high because now you are not dependent on your performance. You are positionally in Christ. You're okay. You're secure. And further than that, you now have the Holy Spirit living inside you. We don't have anything to worry about. There's no need for us to try to make it. No, God's got this. He has made every provision so that we will arrive in safety in heaven. When the Holy Spirit comes in, he gives two resurrections. The Bible says he makes us alive and he does it in two ways. One, there's a spiritual resurrection. And two, there's a physical resurrection. So he makes us alive. See, as Paul says in Ephesians, we just read, we were dead in sin. And the Holy Spirit made us alive. So our bodies now that were dead in sin, we are spiritually resurrected. Sin reigned over us. Sin controlled our thoughts and our actions. Sin determined what our fate would be. Sin decided where we would go. Sin determined how we would feel today. Sin determined how we would react to each other. Sin determined how the quality of our relationships. Sin determined how we would behave in our daily interactions with people sin determined our very life but when we came positionally in christ and the holy spirit took up residence he broke the power of the spirit and he brought us alive in spirit you, you, you don't get this deal do you because if you're alive in the spirit there's something different than when you were under the power and domination of sin. Huh? Don't behave as though your status is uncertain now. Um, read the story some time ago of a Japanese soldier. <clears throat> Uh, who, during the Second World War, fled into the jungle because his, his, the rest of his uh, platoon uh, had been destroyed. He was the only one who escaped. And he fled in the jungle to hide himself. <clears throat> and he lived in that jungle, this was 1944, he lived in that jungle for 28 years. <clears throat> even though the war had been long over, he didn't know it. And 
What's more important, says the story, there came a time when he did come to know that the war was ended, but he felt that he would have been uh, captured and tried as a, um, um, someone who had perpetrated um, atrocities during the war. So in fear of being arrested as an enemy combatant, even though the war was over, he still stayed in the jungle. And he survived on, on eating bugs and, 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 and plants and, and uh, other um, whatever he could find for 28 years. Finally, two people found him and brought him out into the open. And he discovered at that point that he was free all along. Nobody was looking for him. I read that and I think about some of our Christian experience, beloved. We've been set free so long, but we're in the jungle eating bugs. We're in the jungle of uncertainty, ruled by fear, uncertain about what our position is. Wondering if Jesus came today, what would happen to me? I heard a pastor preach that uh, recently. If Jesus came today. I said, if he came today, I'm okay. Because I'm in him already. He's coming for me. He said, if I, he said I'm going to come for you. And I'm going to take you where I am. That where I am there, you may be also. I'm in him. He's talking to me. So stop trying to impress. With your holiness. With your godliness. You're not more godly than, I'm not more godly than anybody else, let's put it properly. <clears throat> and it's, it's not about how many people I, I, I make believe of the Sabbath. You, you understand what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's not about how many people I win. You know? That may, that may, um, that may blow me up more than anything else. I, you know, you remember the days when we used to sing, will there be any stars in my crown? And that was a big deal. I mean, as a, I remember as a young, um, uh, a young worker, I, mean, we, I, wanted heavy, I wanted my crown to be heavy with stars. You know? So win a lot of souls. To you, you know, when you get there, everybody will see, boy, he won a lot of souls. Right? And we're thinking Jesus is just up there keeping the record, so he put stars in our crowns. Well, if, if, if those stars are what got me there, why did he die on the cross? Why did he go through all of that? But he says your position, now when the Holy Spirit is in you, it motivates you, you want to tell other people, and other people will know, etc. We're not denying that, not at all, not by any stretch. We are saying, though, that that's not the basis of your security in Christ. We are saying that when, when the Holy Spirit comes in, he makes you alive in him. That's a spiritual resurrection. So now today, today in church, you are living the spirit-led life. You are living the life. You are living the resurrection life already. You have it. It's in you. You're already living it every day. And then there is the physical resurrection. So he resurrects you spiritually and he resurrects you physically. Ah, yes. So when Jesus comes, like we used to say, when the skies roll back as a scroll and the trumpet sounds, hallelujah for the cross this morning. <clears throat> when the trumpet sounds, we will be resurrected physically all God's people from everywhere clothed in immortality righteous covered by the still covered still covered by the righteousness of Jesus that's the only righteousness that gets me there <clears throat> can I trouble you a little bit before I go pastor Gittins will settle you down when, I, when he comes back bless his heart but I'm going to disturb you just a tiny little bit we used to say, 
we used to say that there will come a time when the children of God will have to survive without a mediator. There is no time, there is no time in my spiritual experience on this earth that I can live without the merits of Jesus Christ covering me. I will not make it. I will never reach the place where I, don't not, where I no longer need the righteousness of Jesus. I will always need it. I will always need it because even for a moment, even for a moment, I can say or do or what, think. Can, think about what Jesus said. If you look at somebody with hatred in your heart, you already committed murder. Seriously? Can you, get, can you meet that standard? Can He says, if you look at a woman... And, and you lust. If you, if you take that second look, yes. you already committed adultery with her. Can you meet that standard? Think about one angry word. He says, by your words you will be justified, by the words you will be condemned. Think about one single word that you can, one angry word. Can you make that standard? There is no time when we will not need the righteousness of Jesus to get us in. We will always need that righteousness. There is no time I can survive in my Christian experience without him. He must always be in me and I must always be in him. His spirit must always live within me. I must always rely on him for my uh, uh, entrance into glory. I must always rely on his spirit to empower me, to guide me. There are those, that's the only basis upon which I will make it. This morning, let us by his grace... Let us by his grace determine that we will continually recognize our complete 100 dependence on him as we journey day by day, as we live day by day. We live in the light of his glory and of his grace. We rely upon him as a rock. We run to him as our shield. He protects us in moments of disaster. He motivates us so that we can live according to his word. Not in our own strength, but by the spirit that resides in us. And as we do this every day, we look forward to the time when his voice will speak. And we will rise up to meet him and go with him to glory forever and ever. Let us give him all the glory all the honor, and all the praise. Amen and amen.